Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 47. These are Jesus' words. He says, You've heard the law that says, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Oh, yeah. But I say, Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven, for he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you only love those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you're, only, you're kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. Ugh, am I right? This may be one of the more difficult passages in all of the Bible. And yet, there it is, in plain view, Jesus' words for us to have to digest. So many questions come to mind for me when I read the words of Jesus here. But the biggest question I have is, how? How? How am I supposed to love the people in my life and in my world who are often against me? How, how am I supposed to love the people in my life that I have determined I am against? How are you supposed to love the family member who is constantly pushing against what you believe and how you live? How are you supposed to love the classmate that constantly bullies and teases you? How are you supposed to love the coworker who all it seems they can do is stab a knife in your back and gossip about you? How, how are you supposed to love the employer who abuses you with words and gives you little regard to your mental and emotional health? How are you supposed to love those who disagree with you on things like politics and religion and lifestyle? How are we supposed to love those who threaten our convictions as followers of Jesus. How? I mean, those are great words, Jesus, but how? I mean, these are the questions that run through my mind as I read the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, and you probably can relate. Because truth is, loving our enemies feels unnatural to us in our world. Revenge and bitterness, well, look, they're just a way of life for us, aren't they? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, you hurt me, I hurt you. We are experts at holding grudges, right? We've, we learned that at a pretty young age. And yet, the way of Jesus says, don't seek revenge. Don't hold a grudge. Love those who are against you. Love those who you disagree with. Love those who live and walk and work differently than you. Now, of course, the flip side of the coin for all of us is that we know revenge and anger and bitterness, they don't really work. They never really satisfy. Being angry and bitter towards those against you or who you are against, it really only seems to hold you back, doesn't it? Which makes me believe that Jesus isn't just offering this instruction to his followers, to love our enemies for the sake of the world. He is doing that. But I also believe Jesus is giving us this instruction for the sake of our heart and our soul as well. And so as we dive into our passage today, we're going to see Jesus' instruction in Matthew chapter 5 to love your enemies played out in real time. We're going to see this instruction applied in real space and in real time. The words of Matthew 5 are going to be applied in an incredibly courageous manner as we come to our passage today. And, and I think that God's given me a lot that we can learn from this story this morning. So with that in mind, uh, if you haven't done so yet, you can go to our YouVersion app, not our YouVersion app, the YouVersion app, and find us there. Go to more and events. You can follow along with everything I'm going to read and cover. You can take notes in there. You can save it for later if you want to come back to it. Or if you have your Bible with you, we are going to be in Acts chapter 9. Now, last week, we looked at the first nine verses of Acts chapter 9. And we looked at Saul, whose life collides with Jesus on the road to Damascus. At the beginning of chapter 9, 
Saul is on a mission to eradicate the world of all of its Jesus followers. He hates those who love and worship and follow Jesus. And he is rooting them out city by city to get rid of them. They are an enormous threat to his belief system and his worldview as a pharisaical Jew. His reality, though, as he's on his way to Damascus, collides with the reality of Jesus. And as a result, everything changes for him in that moment. And after it happens, the book of Acts tells us that Saul is blinded and brought to Damascus by those he is with. He, he, it says that he spends three days there and he doesn't eat or drink anything. He's fasting, he's mourning, he's trying to figure out what just happened to me. This person who I have been against since I first heard of him has now appeared to me and told me that I am supposed to become a follower of him, to become a leader within the group that I have been persecuting and trying to root out of the world so that they would no longer exist. His head is spinning from this collision with Jesus on the road. And so Saul fasts for three days while he's in Damascus. And while that's happening, Jesus approaches another person. The risen Jesus appears to another person to interact with this Saul who is completely confused about his life, which is where we're going to pick up the story in verse 10. Luke writes, Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. This Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, Go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. Not that Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He's praying to me right now. I've shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. Now listen, the only other time that we hear about Ananias in the scriptures is when Saul, later named Paul, mentions him in Acts chapter 22. Paul is telling his story of his you know, the collision with Jesus, and he mentions Ananias as he retells that exact story. Now, Paul, who's currently named Saul in Acts 9, he'll get his name changed later, does give us just a little bit of background on who Ananias is in Acts chapter 22 as he retells the story. And this is how he describes Ananias. He says in verse 12, he was a godly man, deeply devoted to the law, and well regarded by all the Jews in Damascus. In other words, what we know of Ananias is that he's a stand of guy. This is a man to be trusted. He's well respected among the religious community in Damascus, even as a Jewish Christian. Paul says, listen, he's even respected by the Jews. In addition, he happens to be one of the few followers of Jesus left in Damascus when Saul arrives there. Most likely because of this wave of persecution that is being led by Saul throughout Judea and around the surrounding areas in Jerusalem, many of the first followers are scattering further and further and further into the Roman Empire to avoid their in impending death. And so, for whatever reason, Ananias has remained put in Damascus. It is one of the few who remains there. And so Jesus appears to Ananias in the same manner that he appeared to Saul, and he tells him, I need you to go down Straight Street, which actually you could still walk down to this day, to the house of Judas, again, not that Judas, a different Judas, and ask for Saul of Tarsus. Once he meets this Saul of Tarsus, Jesus asks him, I want you to lay a hands on him so he can see again. Now, that seems like a pretty simple task in and of itself. Walk down the street, knock on the door, lay your hands on Saul, Pray for him so he can see again. Got it. Except one thing. Verse 13. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. Like me, Ananias would say. Now let's be very clear about what Jesus is asking Ananias to do here. There is only one person in all of the first century who is fully feared by the followers of Jesus, and that's Saul of Tarsus. 
He has gained a reputation all the way to the streets of Damascus as someone who is terrorizing people who claim Jesus to be the Messiah. He is the person, Saul is, who watched as Stephen was stoned and improved and approved the imprisonment of hundreds, if not thousands, of Christians in Jerusalem. And now he is on his way to Damascus to do the same to the people of Damascus who follow Jesus just like Ananias. And Jesus is saying, I want you to go down the street. I want you to knock on the door. I want you to say hi to Saul of Tarsus, lay your hands on him, and pray for him. Not as easy as it sounds. I mean, there, there is no greater enemy to a Christian in first century Judea than Saul. He is their greatest threat. So it shouldn't come as a shock that Ananias takes pause by Jesus' instructions to go lay hands on Saul, right? I mean, we know Saul has just had a powerful experience with Jesus on the road to Damascus. We have the benefit of having read that, but Ananias has no idea that that's happened. All he knows is Jesus is saying, that Saul guy who's here to kill you, I want you to go to his house, lay hands on him, and pray for him. That is a tall order. I don't care who you are, that is a tall order. I mean, it's, it's likely that Ananias is hiding out in some, you know, cave, maybe closet, maybe upper room, hiding out from this very man. Because he's heard, he's on his way to Damascus, and this guy means business. And yet Jesus is saying, I need you to go to him. Verse 15, after Ananias kind of goes, uh, I don't really want to do that. Um, Jesus, I, I want to make sure I know what you're asking here. It says this in verse 15, but the, but the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer my, for my name's sake. So, Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Verse 19, afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Now, I just want to point out the exchange here between Jesus and Ananias. Jesus gives his instructions and his reasoning for wanting Ananias to go to Saul. And then he says, and then it says, excuse me, Luke writes, so Ananias went and found Saul. Jesus gives the instruction and Ananias goes and does what he asks. Despite whatever hesitations Ananias might have, he goes and he obeys what Jesus has asked him to do. Can you imagine what must have been going through Ananias' head as he walked from wherever he was down Straight Street to Judas' house? I mean, I, I can only imagine he's thinking, is this some sort of trap? Like, what is happening? Has Saul really, has this really happened? What Jesus said, has that really happened to Saul? Because if it isn't, I'm a, like, I'm a dead man walking right now. Why did Jesus choose me to do this? Isn't there someone else who maybe knows a little bit more about what's going on? Is there somebody who maybe knows Saul a little better than I do? Should I have brought a sword with me or something? Like, should I be prepared to defend myself right now? Now, it turns out that things would be just as Jesus said they would be. Ananias lays his hands on Saul. He welcomes him into the family of God. He prays for him. He allows him to be filled with the Holy Spirit and he baptizes him. And this is an incredible picture that Luke paints of what is happening through the gospel in the world. This is Matthew chapter 5, what Jesus said decades earlier, happening in real time and in real space. Ananias refers to Saul as brother even when he prays for them. It, that is a term of, of friendship. It's a term, a, a familial term of inclusion that you now belong to this thing we call the church. 
It says that he prays for him and he baptizes him. All examples of love from Ananias to Saul. And it makes me ask the question, how did this guy do it? I mean, I, I, I've been trying to put my, myself in Ananias' position all week, and I have a hard time doing it because I don't have anyone in my life that is as great a threat as Saul is to Ananias at that moment. I just don't. You probably don't either. There's nobody like chasing me down to kill me right now. Well, at least none that I know of. And if you do know of them, don't tell me because that just makes it worse, I think. Just go tell someone else if someone's after. Go tell the cops. They might be in their break room. No, don't tell me. But I don't know anybody that's trying to chase me down and kill me right now. And so this incredible, powerful scene that Luke paints is this, this application of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. And how he did this is something that I think we all can take note of today. I mean, how was Ananias able to love Saul in the way that he did? His greatest enemy. Well, I think that the answer starts with a different question first. Before we ask how, there's a different question I think we have to ask ourselves when it comes to the instruction of Jesus telling us to go and love our enemies. And that question is this, do we trust Jesus? Do you trust Jesus? You know, I think at the core of Ananias' life is a deeply rooted trust in Jesus. It doesn't mean he doesn't have his questions and doubts. He seems to example that. It doesn't, it, it, but it does mean that when Jesus says something, he has learned that it can be trusted and it should be trusted. Ask yourself, do you trust Jesus? Because at the core of this is this question. Because if we do, then I think that loving our enemies may not be as difficult as it seems. In fact, you could argue that if you refuse to love your enemies, your trust in Jesus is probably really, really low. Only those who trust and have faith in Jesus can do this. That's it. Now, contrary to what we may have been taught or believe, loving those who we are against isn't usually a problem with them, but a problem with us. If we're unable to love those who are against us or, or even those who we disagree with, the first thing we have to do is look within. If we follow Jesus... And Jesus says, I want you to love your enemies, and we can't do that. Then we got to take a deep look inside ourselves and ask the question Do I really trust Jesus? Because at the core of this instruction is a heart changed by the love of God for us. Now, the Bible indicates that because of sin, because of our rebellion, we have become enemies of God. We've chosen that path. In fact, Paul, Saul, right, interchangeable names right now, would write these words later in his life in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. He says, For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his what? Enemies. We will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Look, I've said this so many times before, and I think we just got to keep coming back to it. Jesus never asks us to do something he didn't already do. The Bible indicates that because of our sin, we've become separated with God. We rebelled against God. We said, God, I don't trust you. I'm going to do it my own way. And that even as we were like willingly becoming enemies with God, against God in his way, that God in his love pursued us. So it should be no surprise that Jesus says, yeah, love your enemies. I mean, even as Jesus is hanging on the cross, his final words to the world, our Father forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. So then here's the thing. If you're struggling 
with loving your enemies, those who are against you, or, or you just have a lot of like pent up like anger towards groups of people in this world, and you're just mad at them, and you're just you're bitter, and whatever it might be, you're having a hard time forgiving those who have wronged you. I want you to first take a deep look within yourself. Do I really trust Jesus? Because if I really trust Jesus, then even though the words of Matthew 5 and the example of Ananias in Acts chapter 9 may be difficult, man, my trust in Jesus is greater than any difficulty I may have with it. So start there. Because it's likely that if that's the case, you may need to experience or re-experience the love of God through Jesus again, to be reminded that even while we were separated from him because of our rebellion and sin, because we were against him, that in his love, he came for us, died for us, exampled love in its greatest form for us on the cross, that our friendship with him would be restored. Now, all that said, I also think there are a few things that we can do to help us navigate how to live this out on a daily basis. Because the example of Ananias here is really important for this. We can look at the life of Ananias in this short moment in his life, I should say, and the things that he does that can help us as we figure out how do I actually do this in real time and in real space. Do I trust Jesus? That is the root question. But if I can answer that question, yes, then there's a few things I think we can learn from the life of Ananias. And the first is this, that when we are faced with having to, ch to choose to love our enemies, we must also always choose obedience over feelings. Because here's the thing. Rarely do I feel feel like loving my enemies, right? I mean, this is safe space. It just doesn't feel like a, something I want to do. I am guessing by Ananias' response to Jesus that he didn't really feel like going and seeing Saul. But because of his deep trust in Jesus, he chose obedience over him. Whatever feelings he may have, they were real. I'm not discounting that. But he chose obedience and trust in Jesus over them. You know, James 1, verse 22, you may have heard this before. It says, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Sometimes what the Bible says, it's going to just grate on you. And that's not a bad thing. Right? That's how change occurs in our life. But when that happens, we often have to, we got to choose obedience to what God is doing and saying instead of just what feels right in the time. If we call ourselves followers of Jesus, then we have to follow Jesus, even when we don't feel like it. Look, the truth is, feelings are fleeting. You know that. Like you might have woke up today sad and tomorrow you might wake up happy. They're fleeting. They come and they go. And I'm not saying we shouldn't feel things or even respond to feelings. That's not what I'm saying. But when feelings stray us in the opposite direction of Jesus' instructions, then I think we have to take note. And we have to choose obedience over those feelings. Again, this all goes back to that original question, do you trust Jesus? Because if we don't, we'll likely just trust our feelings when it comes to those against us. And that does not lead down the same path that Jesus is calling us to. But if we trust him, we'll learn to choose obedience over feelings when the time comes. The second thing that Ananias does that I think we can learn from is that he chooses to forgive first. He doesn't wait for Saul to come to him. Oh. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen is being stoned to death. And just like Jesus, he forgives those who are literally in the action of murdering him. He says in Acts chapter 7, verse 60, he fell to his knees because he was being stoned, by the way. And he shouted, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. Did you notice Stephen didn't ask for their forgiveness first. 
Right? Did, did you notice he didn't tell them, hey, uh, are you going to ask me to forgive you Right? as they're stoning him? He didn't wait for them. Instead, even in the act of being killed, murdered, Stephen forgives first. Jesus, again, does the same thing on the cross. We saw that earlier. Forgiving first is this incredibly powerful act when setting into motion the instruction of loving our enemies. It releases you. It releases your heart and your anger that you may have, and it releases the ability for bitterness to take root in your life. It relieves us from seeking revenge and ill will to another person, and it prepares us to do what Jesus asks us to do next, which is this, to pray for them. Look, if you haven't forgiven them, good luck trying to pray for them. And if you do pray for them without having forgiven them, I'm a little nervous about what you're praying for, okay? I mean, that's just real. <laughs> I mean, how many of us have prayed, dear God, smite them today, right? <laughs> Safe place. We've all been there. If we haven't, if we haven't gotten to that place where we can forgive them first, man, praying for them is going to be really difficult, but we got to get there. We've got to get there. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 says, But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. You'll be acting like me. Ananias' first action when seeing Saul is he prays for him. His arrival at the house where Paul is staying is a true act of forgiveness. And it is followed up by Ananias laying his hands on Saul and praying for him. And I can't explain it, but there is something incredibly powerful about praying for those who are against you or praying for those who you have been against for so long. There is something incredibly powerful about praying for their well-being, praying for their relationship with God, praying that they would love that you could love them well and express compassion and in kindness to them praying that you they would see Jesus in you and experience his love through you i think this was an incredibly transformative moment in the life of Saul i mean Jesus is doing so much more here than getting Saul to get on his team so to speak he is showing him this is what the kingdom of God looks like. The people that you were once their greatest enemy are now coming to your door, forgiving you, praying for you, and helping you take a next step in your faith. That's what my love, Jesus would say, looks like. In Romans chapter 12, verse 14, Saul would write these words, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. These kinds of prayers have the power to disarm people and literally change their lives. Much like Saul's did as Ananias laid hands on him and prayed for him. The text says that when he did that, his eyes were open. And yes, Jesus' spirit was moving in that moment, but he was moving through a man who decided, I'm going to choose obedience over my feelings today. I'm going to go and I'm going to knock on the door and I'm going to forgive this man who's after me right now. I'm going to stand by him and lay hands on him and pray for him. And the text says in that moment, Paul's eyes are open. And I don't think they were just open in a physical sense. I think they were open in an enormous spiritual sense as well. Listen, the kingdom of God throws the values of this world on their head. In a world that says, trust your feelings, the kingdom of God says, trust me. In a world that tells us to get our revenge and hold back for forgiveness and hold on to that grudge, the kingdom of God says, don't seek revenge and be first to forgive. In a world that would rather gossip and badmouth those who are against them, the kingdom of God says, pray for them, bless them, wish them well. 
Do you know what the world needs right now, maybe more than anything else? The world needs a community of people who will fully trust Jesus, no matter what he says or what he calls them to, even when it's difficult. The world needs a community of people who will choose love over revenge and forgiveness over bitterness. The world needs a community who will pray for those who are against them and that they are against instead of just wishing people ill will and hoping they would just be eradicated from the earth. And you know what? Do you know who that community is? You want me to say it? It's us. It's us. The Bible says, listen, Jesus loved us while we were still his enemies, while we were still in our sin. He came to us. He lived the life we couldn't live. He died the death that we deserve. He rose again three days later, and now he's calling us to be the people of God in the world, to love in the way that he loved to flip the values of the kingdom of this world on their head and to implement the kingdom of God values in our world. We have now been tasked to be people, as crazy as it may sound or crazy as it may look, who love our enemies. Do you trust Jesus with that? Let's pray. God, it is uh, with great humility that I come to this passage this morning. Just the other day, I sat and complained and begrudged a group of people that had just been kind of, I don't know, annoying me maybe. I don't know. And I walked away just asking for forgiveness. And, and I think we can all confess, God, that this, this instruction you give to us, while we want to we implement it and we want to apply it in our lives, it's difficult, it's challenging. And yet, Jesus, you, you make it evident, you make it clear, not only through your words in Matthew 5, but in the actions of Ananias in Acts chapter 9, that we are called as the people of God, this community of believers to love all people. And yeah, we can talk and debate about what love looks like, and I know there's intricacies in all of that, but in the end, it starts with this deep trust in you. And so this morning, I pray more than anything else that all of us in this room, that the trust level that we have in you would grow this morning. That when we open up our Bibles and we open up our YouVersion app and we read the scriptures, that there would be a deep trust in what you would say that we would be people that when push comes to shove, we would choose obedience over feelings. That we would be quick to forgive first. That we would pray for those who may be against us or for those we disagree with. And that through that, Jesus, that not only would you transform the world around us, but that you would change our hearts. I think that this instruction is at the very core of what it means for us to be a community of changed lives changing lives to be people who have been changed by your love that while we were once enemies with you you have now restored us back to friendship with you through jesus that we have now been sent into the world to love the people around us those who disagree with us those who don't look like us those who don't behave like us those who are against us that their lives too might be changed by the grace and the mercy and the love of your son jesus And so, Father, may we walk in trust this week. And when those moments come where we want to seek revenge, we want to hold the grudge, where bitterness and anger takes root in our hearts and in our souls, you would root it out. That we would be reminded of the words of Matthew 5, that we would be reminded of the actions of Ananias in Acts chapter 9, that we would choose obedience over feelings, that we would seek to love all people, neighbor and enemy. We thank you, Jesus. You are the one whom we follow and trust. We pray all this in Jesus' name.